All right, so before we kick the video off, check what came out in the mail today from the folks over at Toro. So unfortunately, the packing label was put right over the front of this, so it was really hard to see what was actually in here until I ripped all of that off. Um, but this is a 60-volt battery-powered inverter. So this is designed to work with their 60-volt batteries, the same ones that work with their chainsaws, their mowers, all of that stuff. And it gives you essentially inverted power for other things you might want. So you can probably see through there, it has a 120-volt power outlet, a USB-A and a USB-C port as well. Compact, lightweight. It's got a little chart on the side to show you what you can power with this. So you can charge your phone 29 times. You can charge your laptop five times and you can power a 42 inch TV for 11 hours. Let's open this thing up and show you what's inside. Okay, so here it is. Very cool, it's got a big old power button on the back of it. But on the side right here, you can see the 120 volt outlet, USB-A and the USB-C outlet on the side to be able to charge things and power things up. That's pretty cool and it's super compact. It's going to be really interesting to see uh, how effective it is. And the numbers that they showed there are if you use this with the largest 7.5 amp hour battery that, uh, that you can purchase from them. Um, it's definitely their largest and heaviest battery. But I have a 6 amp hour battery that I can throw on here right now just to kind of see what the form factor looks like and uh, power this thing up. Okay, so the battery is just going to pop in place like that as a fully charged battery. I'm sorry, this is actually my two and a half amp hour battery. I thought it was my six amp hour. Maybe it's because I saw the 60 volt and mistakenly confused that for amps. But yeah, this is the two and a half amp hour battery I have. I'm fully charged. You can turn it on from here. That's cool. And then on the side, you have your outlets. Very, very cool. Let's check this thing out on something that it should be able to power. Okay, so on the floor next to it, I have this Lasco little floor fan. Let's turn this thing on. Very cool. Okay. So it's going to be limited in terms of how much power output it can put out. But it's working pretty well, to be honest. And again, this thing isn't really designed to power up anything super heavy. It's mainly designed to kind of recharge your phones, recharge a laptop, or provide power to a laptop, and uh, plug this thing into a TV or something that you might want to bring with you on a camping trip or a portable trip. Maybe you're going out working on a site and you want to be able to power something really small. This is going to give you that capability. And it's really cool that it actually has 120 volt power on it versus just your typical USB and small USB-Cs. But what this really allows you to do is to take advantage of the fact that if you have their 60 volt batteries, you have the ability to utilize them for more than just the power tools. You can use it as a charger, you can plug in a light, like a, an LED lamp or something like that. Again, you can recharge your equipment out there. And it's just, again, a more expandable use case for the battery line that you've probably spent a lot of money on. So if you have Toro batteries, these things can be very, very expensive, especially if you have the 7.5 amp hour battery. If that's the case, you probably spent like 350 400 bucks for a battery. And it's nice to be able to use those batteries for just about anything else you want to use them for, any other tools that they, uh, they work with. And to have something like this to be able to support those batteries just gives you an extra reason to go with this this specific product line. And because I know a lot of people are going to want to know the specifications of this, again, this takes a 60 volt max lithium ion batteries, 330 watt continuous, 450 watt momentary, modified sine wave. So that's interesting. It's not pure sine wave, it's modified sine wave. But there it is. Anyways, again, big shout out to the folks over at Toro for providing this for me for review and evaluation. I'll definitely uh, put this thing through the ringer and see how it works. Okay, so it's been a kind of weird, muggy set of days. These last several days have just been just completely fog-filled, humid, kind of nasty, wet days to be outside. That said, uh, we had the Toro out, and um, I ran down to the front of the property with it, and something weird was happening. It was rocking kind of diagonally. So... You would sit on it and these two tires right here seem to be the pivot point and this tire would come off the ground and just freely spin 
and the back tire would skid out really easily. So I'm trying to figure out what the heck is going on. We get it back here to the garage um, and pretty quickly I realized the back tire is really low on air. Now, with only about eight PSI in the back tire, it doesn't look like it's really low on air. One way you can kind of tell just by looking at it is you can see a bit of a crown to the top of a tire that has the proper amount of air in it. And when you look at a tire like this one that didn't, it kind of divoted in just a little bit, but you really couldn't tell just by looking at the sidewall of the tire like you can on a lot of vehicles that are low on air pressure. But even then, surprisingly enough, you really can't even tell by that because again, it doesn't take a heck of a lot of air in a tire to make the tire look kind of normal. Uh, that said, I added air to that tire and it rocked it back into place and put pressure on this one. Well, a couple days later, same thing happened. I walked up and that tire looked like it was divoted in slightly came up to this tire, kicked it, and the thing just freely spun around. So added air back to that tire, and I thought I was, you know, all good and done until I realized that this tire was also low on air. So I had this tire low on air, the back corner tire low on air. Diagonally this way, both of these tires caused it to essentially pivot or rock on these two tires, and it was doing this really weird kind of rocking motion. So uh, one thing I did that might be a little different than what most people might do, and this is mainly because of the hobby that I have, is I added air to the tire, but before I did that, I drained all the air out, and instead of using the traditional kind of fix-a-flat material or a plug, I went to my mountain biking stash and I picked up uh, this endurance sealant from Orange Seal. This is actually made for mountain bikes, so I assume that, you know, thorns, things like that, that could punch a hole in the tire, would probably you know, be the same result for these tires as they would be for a mountain bike tire. So I took probably half of this container, it was full, and I filled up the back tire with most of it and then put quite a bit of it in this tire as well. But I did pull the tires off the ground and I was squirting them with some soapy water and I did find where the air was leaking out of this one. It was definitely a slow leak, but it was enough to, uh, to drain the tire over a couple of days. This one right here, I could not find the leak. I uh, cleaned it off really well, filled it up, sprayed it. It might have been around the bead. I'm not exactly sure where the leak was on this one, but it was also leaking. I just couldn't use soapy water to find the specific leak. But after I put this material in, I drove it around the yard a couple times, and the leak appears to be gone. Now, when you're mountain biking, if you put the stuff in your tires, you'll actually see where it comes out of the holes, and it kind of seals up the area. It can get kind of nasty at times, depending on how large or small the hole is. But on these tires, I'm imagining because the rubber is going to be significantly thicker on both the front and back tires, it probably makes it its way about halfway into the hole and then seals it off. But yeah, we got it all fixed up. This stuff worked really well. This isn't really a brand thing. You can probably use any type of mountain bike tire sealant and it would work just as effectively. The great thing is it's designed to go into really, really tiny holes and it's really designed to seal up tubeless tires on a bike. So you can mount them to your bicycle. You can, you know, fill them up with air and, and you don't have to worry about the bead breaking or small things that puncture the tire, you know, causing you to have a flat on the trail. But yeah, really cool, worked well. and. It uh, seems that this stuff is a little bit more universal than, than I might have thought originally, and I had a full bottle of it. Actually, I have a bunch of this stuff and figured we'd give it a try, and it seems to be working. All right, so we're on to the Q&A portion of this video. So, I get a lot of questions on my Big Truck Big RV YouTube channel from folks wanting to know about certain aftermarket accessories and components and how they affect the towability of whatever they're towing, whether it's going to be a fifth wheel, whether it's going to be a conventional style trailer, whether it's going to be a gooseneck trailer. And it's a very valid point because people, you know, buy towing accessories to give them an enhanced towing experience most of the time. So a lot of folks wonder with the Reese goose box on the front of a fifth wheel, does it change how the vehicle handles side to side wind or side to side motion? Because when you're using a traditional fifth wheel plate like this, Whenever you have your fifth wheel and the kingpin attached to this plate, this plate really doesn't rock side to side very much. Of course, there's going to be a little bit of motion in terms of frame flex of your vehicle. This has some urethane pads underneath these two pivot points, so it'll be able to flex a little bit right there. On some of them, they have a little bit more side to side motion built into them, but you just naturally kind of assume 
this is going to create kind of a, an anti-rocking motion, kind of like how friction sway control hinges prevent your trailer from hinging with the vehicle. This might prevent your fifth wheel from rocking side to side. And I'm sure it does. I'm sure there's some aspect to using a traditional fifth wheel hitch with a kingpin on the front or the pin box and a kingpin on the front of a fifth wheel that will help it and control that side to side rocking. But my counter to that is the reason why the goose box is such a desirable product, of course, is because it clears up the bed of your truck. It gives you a gooseneck type towing experience over a ball versus over a traditional hitch. And it actually reduces some weight from your vehicle overall because when you look at a traditional pin box, which can weigh about, let's just say anywhere between 100 to 175 pounds, depending on its setup and its configuration and the type of pin box you're using, the overall weight of your fifth wheel hitch plus that pin box is canceled out by the weight of the goose box, which is about 175 pounds plus the weight of the ball, which is probably 10 pounds. So you end up shaving about 100 pounds of payload from the vehicle by using a goose box in most setups. And sometimes it's a lot more weight you're eliminating, sometimes it's a little bit less weight, but you end up eliminating some weight and definitely a lot of clutter from the bed of your truck and a lot of bulk. That said though, um, yes, you're probably gonna get inherently a little bit more side-to-side -side rocking control from something like this, simply because of the engineering of the design, the way it's designed to function and how it works with a pin box on a fifth wheel. That said, when you have a fifth wheel with a significant amount of weight over the back axles and a significant amount of weight towards its center mass as you work your way towards the front, the pivot point of the front isn't necessarily going to matter as much anymore simply because the majority of your weight is being spread out and stabilized over the axles as well as over the lowest point of the RV. Typically if you have a drop frame in that area right in the mid belly area where your tanks are and all of that. So I've never specifically heard of a case where because somebody switched to a goose box they had difficulty under windy conditions controlling the RV because of a side to side rocking motion. Now, there have been instances that I've seen semi-tractor trailers flip over because the wind hitting them. And when that occurs, you know, both the RV and the truck tend to roll together because of that solid kind of flat nature of the pivot point and the fact that the RV is only going to rock to a certain point before it's going to take the vehicle with it. And I don't think a goose box would change that at all. I think by having a goose box over a ball, you'll experience that exact same thing, but the trailer will, will certainly rock more before it starts impacting the truck itself. Now, that could be a good thing and it could be a bad thing. It could simply mean that you have more time to get it under control before the truck itself starts to overturn with the trailer, but it could also mean that that rocking motion could get serious enough to where it could cause the issue, but I don't think that would be the case. I know there's a lot of smart people that watch the channel, so if you watch the channel and you, uh, you, you have an expertise in this area of physics, you, you might want to chime in in the comments. But um, I, again, I, I don't think there's been a circumstance that I've heard of where somebody has had so much wind that it's caused an uncontrollable rocking motion of the vehicle and it's eventually caused a goose box equipped RV to roll over with the tow vehicle in front of it. Um, now, that said, I think the reason for that is, is typically when you get sustained winds, that would be high enough to cause your RV to start acting in that manner. You'll probably get through those winds before they've had a chance to impact your RV, unless you're going through a hurricane or you're going through a tornado. Um, but those side crosswinds that you typically see, um, yeah, they, they definitely can be devastating. And again, you see semi trucks quite often that kind of flip over because of it. But when it comes to RVing, I would just assume that you just don't get yourself in that situation if you can avoid it. And I know most people don't get themselves in that situation because they try to avoid it. But I know there's the occasion where you can't avoid it and you're on a road that I would assume you would just pull over and not get into a scenario where you think the winds would hit you hard enough that it could roll your RV regardless of what type of coupling system you have. So again, when it comes down to it at the end of the day, it really is dependent on the wind, the environment. Will an RV with a goose box have more of a tendency of rocking under extreme windy conditions, 70, 80 mile per hour crosswinds? 
probably. Um, is it going to be such a huge difference that it would control or, or, or prevent an accident by having this over that? That's where I don't think it would be. Um, I think when it comes down to it at the end of the day, you have so much weight resting over the axles, the center point and the rear of your RV, plus the weight that's just pressing down over the back of your vehicle, I think more of your issue would probably come into play with the truck and trailer combination just being hit with that much wind, regardless of what type of coupler you have. Anyways, I sure hope that answers the question. I know it's not a 100% definitive answer because I can't dictate environmental conditions. I can't specifically say these conditions would specifically lead to that type of an incident occurring, but I've never heard of it. And there's a lot of people who use the goose box. There's a lot of people who tow uh, gooseneck trailers. And, you know, gooseneck trailers tend to be a little bit lo more low profile than a fifth wheel, unless you have like a dry van or a box container loaded on the back of it. But at the same time, you know, I, I don't hear a lot of wind related accidents with goosenecks rolling on their side. Typically, I hear more more related to evasive maneuvers that people have had to take or just driving a little too fast, going around corners, doing things that they shouldn't do. But it's the same with a fifth wheel at that point. So it's really the environment you're in, what you're doing and what specific elements, what specific factors cause the type of accident or cause the type of situation you would need to be in to get into an accident. Anyways, guys, I sure hope you've enjoyed this video. If you haven't had a chance, please take a moment, subscribe to my channel, give me a thumbs up. We'll talk to you again very soon.